Thanks for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Bitter cold is bearing down on millions of people in the eastern half of the country today, and it's only expected to get worse. The frigid temperatures plus snow and ice are making for dangerous, if not deadly, travel conditions. Heather Sells is on this story. The nation is bracing for another deep freeze today and tomorrow. This latest dose of polar vortex is bringing a surge of Siberian air that will hit 24 states and unleash record-breaking cold. I just want it gone. I just want it gone. Sub-zero lows will blast from the Midwest into the western mid-Atlantic today and tomorrow. Forecasters are looking at lows of minus 20 in states like Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, and yes, right here in Virginia. It's just, it's awful. <laughs> the cold plus snow plus ice has created dangerous driving conditions in many states. In Tennessee, a state of emergency. Winter weather encrusted this plain in Nashville and turned streets into virtual skating rinks. Schools are closed in many places for the rest of the week. Yeah, it's terrible. Today is bitter cold. Farmers in southern states are covering up their crops to protect them. In Philadelphia, the Coast Guard is using special icebreakers to keep the Delaware River flowing and commercial traffic moving. In hard-hit Boston, heavy snow has caused more than 80 roofs to collapse. At this skating rink, it slid off the roof and buried five people. And you could tell it was hurt, you know, with like his neck. Uh, and then the lady looked very hurt too. In Virginia Beach, another rescue. A neighbor came to the aid of two brothers who fell through the ice into this pond. Both are okay. Going forward, expect wind chill advisories in 24 states, including Florida, and a few scenic sites along the way, like the frozen spectacle of Niagara Falls. Beautiful, it's awesome. Heather Sells, CBN News. And this rough winter weather has created a real hardship for some people, especially in areas that don't see snow very often. That's why Operation Blessing is working in Hampton Roads, Virginia, to remove snow for the elderly and people with serious illnesses. Well, I've stayed in the house because um, I didn't want to drive. And um, yes, I'm taking radiation. And yesterday um, they called and said that they were OK with me staying home. But I felt like today. I really needed to get there. It's a godsend, it truly is. I just i am so thankful that y'all were able to come and do this for me because I really feel like I need to get my treatment today. Operation Blessing received many calls for help from elderly people and others who needed to get to cancer or dialysis treatments or simply to get to the pharmacy for critical prescriptions. Operation Blessing teams made it possible for them to get where they needed to go. President Obama says the global war on terrorism is really about battling extremism and not Islam. He held a news con a conference with prominent Muslims and experts Wednesday, where he argued that terrorists are not real Muslims. They no more represent Islam than any madman who kills innocents in the name of God represents Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism or Hinduism. No religion is responsible for terrorism. People are responsible for violence and terrorism. The president rejected the idea that Islam is inherently violent or that there is some sort of clash of civilizations. He says he doesn't want to mention Islam when talking about terrorism because it would give Islamic radicals a tool they can use to recruit new fighters. When Muammar Gaddafi was killed, many Libyans hoped their country would be free. Just four years later, the country is in chaos and the Islamic State dominates parts of eastern Libya. The country has now become the Western Front in the war against ISIS. Chief International Correspondent Gary Lane brings us this inside look at Libya then and now. CBN News visited Libya in the summer of 2011 when anti-government forces were fighting to overthrow Muammar Gaddafi. We spent several days with Coptic Christians from Egypt who granted us exclusive access to a Sunday service. They told us they were in Libya serving the Libyan people. Most were doctors, nurses, and teachers. We also visited Derna, a coastal city in eastern Libya, not far from the Egyptian border. Of course, the people here in eastern Libya are elated to finally be free from Gaddafi, but they know their freedom comes with a cost, not only in war dead and wounded, but also they know there's a long struggle ahead to rebuild their government and their lives. 
Little did we know back then that the people of Derna would come to be dominated in 2014 by Al-Qaeda and members of ISIS. This is what a grieving Libyan father in Benghazi told us he wanted back then. We ask the American people to stand up with us in this affliction, to support us with weapons and international resolutions and money to eliminate this tyrant. But instead of democracy, some Libyans have replaced one form of dictatorial rule with another that is much worse. And instead of freedom of religion, ISIS has given them this. As a result, Egypt's President al-Sisi responded with force. The people of the port city of Derna woke up to this. And as ISIS attempts to expand its reach and attack more foreigners, the war front is expanding. ISIS now faces more aggressive opposition from moderate Muslim governments, not only from the Kurds on its eastern front in Iraq, but also from the Jordanians. They're striking at the heart of ISIS in Syria. And now the Egyptians are hitting Libya to the west. And Egypt has called for international intervention to defeat ISIS in Libya. The request comes as fears grow about ISIS possibly using Libya as a base to launch attacks against Italy. Gary Lane, CBN News. Atlanta's former fire chief is suing the mayor and the city over his dismissal. Kelvin Cochran's federal lawsuit alleges the mayor, Kasim Reed, fired him because of his religious beliefs and violated his constitutional rights. Cochran is a Christian. He was fired in January after calling homosexuality vulgar and the opposite of purity in his book titled, Who Told You You Were Naked? The mayor has said the chief was terminated over his judgment and management skills and his personal religious beliefs are not the issue. A Washington state florist who refused to provide flowers for a gay wedding has been found guilty of breaking the law. A state judge ruled Wednesday that Baronel Stutzman, the owner of Arlene Flowers, violated the state's consumer protection and anti-discrimination law. Stutzman argues her actions were protected by her right to religious freedom. But the judge ruled while religious beliefs are protected by the First Amendment, actions based on those beliefs aren't necessarily. He also ruled Stutzman must provide full wedding support for same-sex ceremonies. The White House promised an appeal after a federal judge in Texas temporarily blocked President Barack Obama's executive action on immigration. But an appeal's victory is not assured. Dale Hurd explains. U.S. District Judge Andrew Hannon's decision earlier this week blocked President Obama's executive orders to keep as many as five million illegal aliens from being deported. With respect to the ruling, we, I disagree with it. Uh, I think the law is on our side. Supporters of amnesty for illegals were outraged by the judge's ruling, but viewed the court order as a temporary setback. You never want to lose a round in court, uh, but we also know that this is a very early round. Uh, this is an injunction. Uh, the judge did not rule on the merits of the case. This judge wouldn't listen to us, but we're going to go to another judge, and he wouldn't listen to us. We'll go to another judge until the other judge until they listen to us. But Hannon's ruling may be hard to challenge, and the White House faces a difficult and possibly lengthy legal battle because Hannon's ruling was legally sound, that President Obama violated federal law. The president overstepped the constitutional boundaries, and that's what we've been saying, my Republican colleagues up in Congress for months now. It was nice to have a federal judge weigh in and say, yeah, you're right. But Hannon didn't rule on constitutionality, but on procedure, which the White House did not follow. The Justice Department's appeal could take months. Dale Hurd, CBN News. ISIS is on the move, aiming for Rome, and the blood of Christians is already on their hands. Hear what it's like for the remaining believers in the Middle East. The story's next. ISIS burst onto the world stage last summer when it captured Mosul, Iraq's second largest city, and began brutally killing its hostages for all the world to see. Now ISIS threatens to go beyond the Middle East and is promising to fly the flag, its flag rather, over the White House. Take a look. Following its blitzkrieg on Iraq, CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell traveled to the front lines of ISIS. This is the end of the road for the Kurdish military. This is their last checkpoint. But if you look down the road here and see that bridge in the distance, that's the first checkpoint for ISIS and the beginning of the region and the area that they control. He also sat down with the Peshmerga, the Kurdish military, 
heard horrific stories from Yazidi families and met those Christian refugees who came face to face with ISIS and shared their gripping accounts. They take everything from the house, from the store, everything. And they take like a machine, everything, because they are Christian. Just the name Christian. They hit Christian especially. We don't know why. Jesus save me. Oh, Forgive them. Forgive them. Because they didn't know. They didn't know what they want, what they act. Mitchell chronicles those experiences in his new book, Destination Jerusalem, which follows the rise of ISIS, the threat it poses to the world, and the tragic persecution of Christians in the Middle East. The book also shows how you can prepare for the dangerous days that lie ahead. Chris Mitchell is with us now. Now, you were in northern Iraq just after ISIS started this war. Now they have the first caliphate in nearly a century. What impressed you to write this book? Well, I had the opportunity to, to meet firsthand and have firsthand experience with a lot of the people that were affected by ISIS. For example, we got in uh, one of the refugee tents with a former Iraqi soldier who told us, uh, as an interrogator, he told us what ISIS goals were. We talked with a Yazidi uh, woman who just lost her, her, her uh, son because he went back to the village to get some food. He was captured by ISIS and beheaded. We talked to a number of Christians who had to leave their homes and their livelihood because of ISIS. And I felt after having these experiences, it was important for people here in the West and the United States to understand the goals of ISIS, to understand the Christian persecution going on in the Middle East, and finally actually helping prepare for the days ahead. We're living in a dark time in history right now. We need to be prepared for the days that are coming. We need knowledge indeed. Yeah. What was the reaction of Christians uh, you talked with about the atrocities of ISIS? Well, they were given four choices, Ephraim. They, 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 first of all, they could leave their homes, maybe that they had lived in for years, uh, or generations. They could uh, pay the jizza tax, which is this Islamic tax mm -hmm. for non-Muslims, for infidels. They could convert. They could uh, become a Muslim by saying the Shahada in the presence of two witnesses, or they could die by the sword. So given those four choices, uh, most obviously left. And uh, I think it's just incumbent upon us to understand what they're going through and uh, how we can support them, how we can pray for them, and how we can uh, be there for them during this time. Now, you write in your book the importance of knowing your enemy. Why is it so important when fighting ISIS? Well, it's important because, uh, you know, my father fought in World War II. He fought Nazism. Others have fought in the Korean War. They fought communism. And right now, our generation is fighting Islamism. And this is something that we need to recognize and know your enemy. There is, uh, and it seems like our current administration doesn't even want to uh, confess or admit what militant or radical Islam is. And in the book, I quote from a, a Chinese military tactician, his name is Sun Xu, and he said, if you know your enemy and yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. Mm -hmm. If you know yourself and not your enemy, for every victory you achieve, you shall suffer defeat. If you know not your enemy nor yourself, you'll succumb in every battle. And so I think it's one of the prerequisites of being in a battle, being in a war, is knowing who your enemy is, knowing yourself and how you can fight the battle. Wow. Now, Netanyahu's Likud party is running an ad right now showing ISIS terrorists asking an Israeli for directions right. to Jerusalem. How do you handle, how do Israelis handle this feeling of being completely surrounded by people who essentially just want to wipe them out? Uh, well, actually, Israelis are pretty resilient. Uh, they've actually mm -hmm. been surrounded by their enemies for most of their modern history. And so they're used to Hezbollah on the northern border, Hamas on their southern border. Now, ISIS is not one more enemy to their east, including Iran, which is further further to the east. So I think they get used to it. The ad, I think, was designed by Likud to, to sort of remind people of what the ultimate goal of ISIS is. And they want to take over Jerusalem and have that as the future of their caliphate, which is sort of like an Islamic empire. And that's not only the goal of ISIS, it's the goal of Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda. There's a prophetic movement, actually, in part of these uh, groups to see that one day they're going to take over Jerusalem. And so the battle lines, and that was the reason maybe for the uh, title of the book, mm. Destination Jerusalem, that's exactly where they're headed. Mm. Now, spiritually, this is such a critical time for the mm -hmm. Middle East. And in your book, you talk about preparing for the days ahead. How should we be looking at this? 
Well, I think that right now the, the, the news is so horrific. It's almost day by day, whether it's 21 cops that were beheaded or 45 Iraqis that were burned to death or Jordanian pilot. Uh, these are very taxing times, and they're weighing heavily on us spiritually and emotionally. And what I do in the book is talk about how we can be prepared, that we can watch and pray, that we can draw close to the Lord, that we can pray for others, and that we can give to others. We don't have to be fatalistic about what's happening. We can actually participate. Our colleague Wendy Griffith wrote a book called Praying the News, mm -hmm. and that's something that we can do when we see these things happen. But we need to be prepared spiritually and emotionally for the days that are coming. Mm, real quickly, you brought two things with you. What do you want us I to know I did too. These, these are just things, reminders for me. It's a New Testament given to me by a man who was uh, almost killed by ISIS. This was a piece of candy given to me by a woman who was had less and lost almost everything. Mm -hmm. And I give I keep it as a reminder of to remind me of those thousands of Christians who have lost nearly everything that we need to pray for them and support them. We indeed must remember. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Ephraim. Up next, want to have a healthier heart? Get moving. We're going to explain why doctors say it doesn't take much to make a big difference. If you have a peanut allergy, you might want to avoid cumin. The Food and Drug Administration is issuing a warning after traces of peanut were found in the spice. Hundreds of products have been recalled. Health officials say if you have a peanut allergy, you should also avoid products that contain cumin. Well, all it takes is just a few rounds of moderate exercise each week to help your heart. A British study found that it tracked more than a million women and found that moderate exercise, enough to make you sweat or raise your heart rate, could cut a middle-aged woman's risk for heart disease, blood clots, and stroke. One expert in the U.S. told Health Day News it doesn't take the commitment of an athlete just two to three times a week is enough to help to protect your heart. Well, the NBA All-Star Weekend game is over, but the events are going on throughout the week in New York City. Angela Zadipak talked to some All-Star players and faith leaders about their efforts to strengthen families. Well, the entire NBA universe has descended upon New York City, and that can only mean one thing. It's NBA All-Star Weekend. Former Knicks player and two-time All-Star athlete Allen Houston has teamed up with other players off the court to throw the first annual Family All-Star Jam. The Allen Houston Foundation paired up with the Soul Exchange Sneaker Show, sharing an important message for today's youth and their families. We really want to do something fun where we brought families and kids together. The goal is to really make, you know, a purposeful day fun. Incorporating a DJ, basketball demos, and other NBA players, Houston wanted to design an interactive approach to teach his foundation's message. We just came up with continue to do programs and basketball camps, and one day, FIZZLE, the acronym of Faith, Integrity, Sacrifice, Leadership, and Legacy, just came to my mind, and we developed a curriculum around it. Now we're doing these events around it. If we really want to be relevant to this culture, and to society. We're going to have to speak the word of the Lord in a way that is not offensive and doesn't shut them off from receiving it. What better way than to throw a whole bunch of sneakers in the room, some of your best music, and uh, you know, an all-star, and then have me as MC, because I'm crazy. Houston hopes that the foundation and tonight's event can help inspire the youth on connecting with their families, specifically fathers and their children. He brought his own father tonight that actually taught him how to walk on a basketball court. For years, my father and I have talked about just to having the importance of legacy with having young men and women have an important male figure in their lives and fathers how, you know, we just feel like there's a void. We are dealing with an epidemic of fatherless homes. And so uh, we're turning everywhere else uh, to, for people to, uh, to be fathered. People are turning everywhere else. So we're looking to music, we're looking to rap stars, we're looking to athletes. The whole idea of this event tonight is to push men to take responsibility, uh, head towards commitment, be faithful, and be who God created them to be, which is faithful men. Today was a seed, you know? We won't see the fruit of this for a while, but we did our part, and that's how I feel. All-star events are continuing throughout the week here in New York City. For more information on Allen Houston's foundation, visit CBNNews.com. I'm Angela Zadipek, CBN News, New York City. And fizzle is a word to remember. Faith, integrity, sacrifice, and legacy. Stay with us. We're coming right back.
And welcome back. A young man in Texas was arrested for stealing. The person who turned him in might surprise you. The surveillance video aired on a local news station in Houston. A woman saw it and realized one of the teenagers burglarizing the home was her son. So she called the police and had him arrested. The man whose home was broken into is applauding that mom. I'm happy about it, actually, because she it might seem as if she is selling him out or turning him in or something like that, but she's doing him a service. She's helping him become a better individual and a better person for our society. She is. The mother said she did not want to speak on camera, but she had this message. Just tell all those mothers out there that if their son does this, turn them in. It's a tough lesson and it hurts, but it's for their own good. And finally, this hour on CBN Newswatch, CBN continues its commitment to reach millions of Spanish-speaking people with a Christian perspective on news. Recently, CBN dedicated a new office in Costa Rica for Mundo Cristiano, the Spanish version of Christian World News. Several ministry partners, along with special musical guests, took part in the event. Mundo Cristiano has been in production for eight years and airs on 90 television stations and 300 radio stations. The program also has an estimated 140,000 followers on Facebook and growing. Well, that is going to do it now for CBN News Watch. Remember, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. Take the time to tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do it on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. It's Thursday. Make it a thankful one.